What's up, everyone? We are live. Um, I see some people starting to roll in. What's going on, Steve? Um, for everyone that's just joining, um, my partner tonight is Miguel, the owner of Great Lakes Finesse. Um, and we're here to talk about a lot of really cool things. So obviously, we're talking about the brand, brand new Great Lakes Finesse baits they just launched. So we'll kind of touch on that. But Dan is like uh, a smallmouth nerd like I am. So we're going to talk a lot, a lot about like smallmouth strategies. So early spring, springtime smallmouth strategies and uh, some things that you guys can hopefully learn from. And then obviously, as we lead into that, we're obviously talking about some of the new baits. So what's going on, man? How are you? Good, man. Just like really really excited a little burnt out uh just been a crazy wild ride here um you know just leading up to these product releases and then now since we launched it's just been an absolute it's just been mayhem it's like it's been unbelievable like in a good way all positive stuff yeah. well especially like leading into the classic right like i know you're doing you did smallmouth crush last night you guys talked a lot about the baits and the dev side of it then you're on burley tomorrow i think yeah um, yeah so you guys are yeah, yeah it's gonna be a marathon yeah and then uh we'll be with uh btl on thursday so yeah everyone wants to talk about this stuff and you know there's just so much appetite right now for a great lakes finesse release because it's been well over a year since we've released anything and even what we've released was just kind of like line extensions so you know for me i've been just dying to get some of this stuff out <laughs> everyone um so yeah, it's just really exciting. I'm I'm having a blast. And even even though last night I got to bed super late, I still couldn't sleep because I was too excited. So it's just been good. I mean, like how long have you had a lot of this new stuff that you've been working on? I mean, we talked offline, but like the Helgramite, how long have you been fishing a Helgramite or, or basically this one? Well, this specific one, one full season. Um and then Helgramites in general, I mean, I put picked up the Berkeley Gulp one when I was like maybe 10 years ago, that first one. It was really small, but it was it's pretty bad. It dried up right away. And that was kind of the first one I ever caught a smallmouth on. And then there's been a few. I've always been keeping an eye on the Helgramite category, always were looking for one that I felt would really play in tournaments for us. And we've there's been a couple that have been reasonable that we've been able to utilize in tournaments and um you know when we had an opportunity to develop our own and really fill fill a gap for us in terms of like what we were looking for situationally um i was really excited to develop this so this was actually the number one product um that i intended to release this year was the was the helgramite the juicy helgramite and then also of course the juvie craw which um you know is really exciting but yeah helgramites are let me put it this way when i showed our pro staff and some of these guys fish on the um the elite series and uh, like the opens like there's one like evan kung for example he's leading the opens right now he's one of our pro staff he fishes locally i fished against them um danny mcgarry who is cooper gallant's tournament partner around here oh, yeah. friends with those guys like when i showed them they were almost mad that i was releasing the helgramite because it's just something that was so tight-lipped and including you know there's a couple brothers that do really well and all these guys live and compete locally here They're like all these guys live like 20 minutes to half an hour for me like the so the competition is fierce around here and that, that's really what's driven a lot of the product development and a lot of this technique and super finesse stuff that we've done is trying to compete with really these elite level anglers that are all fishing here against me um it's, it's funny because like when you message me the product lineup i saw the juvie crown was obviously really excited about it and you're like okay yeah that's really cool but the helgramite and you yeah. kind of told me like that's the deal so for anyone that hasn't seen it like this is the helgramite it's what is it two two and almost two and a half inches 2.4 inches so yeah. it's a pretty i mean it's a standardly small profile but like when do you pick this up like when do you start throwing a helgramite or is it something that you just don't put down honestly i i throw it year round um there are times when helgramites will will be a little bit more active um but honestly for me it's a profile that they don't see and i think just instinctually a smallmouth sees it and they're like i need to eat it because they feel like it's something that they would eat and uh you know juvenile smallmouth we kind of got into that yesterday when i was talking to smallmouth crush guys um 
you know, we were talking about like the juvenile bass and growing up on small insects and stuff. So I think it's, it's more just instinct and they just feel like they need to eat it. And they, they absolutely smoke a Helgramite. It, it's incredible. Um, there's times where we can't get anything to go except for a Helgramite. And uh, those are the tournaments I love when I know it's fishing tough, but they'll eat a Helgramite. Um, we've won some money on that when that scenario has taken place. That's nuts. So I'm playing with this uh, brown pumpkin special color. Like the yep. first one that I grabbed out of the box, like this was the one that was like caught my eye. Um, yeah, it, it's my favorite one. Um, that's why it's called, there's special on it. It's, it's brown pumpkin. It's kind of a more natural color. I mean, most people would probably gravitate towards the black, but I think mixing in the brown pumpkin special, like if, the, if you're going to fish two, these are the two that I would fish. Um, these are the ones I would usually go for. I mean, there's some other colors that work like the green pumpkin, of course, um, like that one right there, just plain green pumpkin. That one's really good. And then the green pumpkin purple is another color that I like, but, um, you know, what really separates these Helgramites from the other ones to come before it is there's two things. One is the, the matte finish. So all of our baits have that matte finish, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. Yeah, and that's a, a huge tournament secret. Like it, I kept that one so quiet for years, and like people would literally see when I'm fishing in a tournament. Like if we're on an offshore hump, I wouldn't even care if guys got near me because I knew that the difference was the like me rolling the baits in the carpet of our boat to knock the glare off, yeah. and knew they wouldn't be doing it, and they would be fishing beside me, and just they could not understand why we were catching and they weren't and that so that we figured out how to do that in the manufacturing so the Helgram might all they all have that and that's something that you don't find um on the baits that exist today also i've yet to see one that, that that's this small and then the third thing is the neutral buoyancy so we figured out how to get these baits to sit perfectly level in the water column without having to move it so most baits either sink or they float and when you're drop shotting either of those two you constantly need to move it and be bringing the bait towards you with this you can just let it sit there and smallmouth hate that like they it drives them absolute absolutely bonkers especially if they're you know relating to a piece of structure that's offshore or a dock or you know a big boulder on a flat like you put that thing right beside it you let it sit there and that's smallmouth i've seen them they'll just swim around the rock and just get angrier and angrier and then eventually they'll eat it. So that true neutral buoyancy allows you, it gives you that opportunity to, to do a dead stick presentation. And um, I've actually found that the Helgramite, for me, has worked, <clears throat> worked better on a drop shot than dragging it on the bottom, which most people would fish it naturally, like a Ned style bait or drag it on the bottom. It's kind of any, any bait really, but yeah, on a drop shot, I believe that ours is really the only one that's truly drop shottable, if that's a, a word or, you know I don't, i'd probably get you know typo if i try to type that in an email but um nothing else i feel presents properly on a drop shot in the helger might shape i just think it's super interesting like this would never be i don't want to say it would never be like a bait of choice because i picked up a darter for 10 years which looked like absolutely nothing and looked terrible like really a darter looked terrible but I had this conversation um, with my buddy who's a big smallmouth guy. Sometimes there's a bait that just has like terrible action or like no action. And that is the best smallmouth bait. And for me, like that was the Erie darter years ago. The four inch Erie darter was a big body bait, just caught fish. And like, I think there is something to be said about baits that just don't really have a ton of action down there. Like you put it on a drop shot and you can just hold it there and it just doesn't really do a whole lot of anything. Yeah. Like, what no, hook I, are you going to run, run on this? Like just your standard, like size one or size two drop shot hook? Like yeah, one cool. or two um, size. I find the Gamagatsu G S works really well. Um, a good, more affordable alternative to that hook is like a, a, a Ryugi fog shot size two. Um, but if I'm in a tournament, I'm going to go with that Gammy G Finesse. Um, just tried and true. And yeah, I have yeah. faith in that hook, and it pairs really well with with this bait, the drop minnow, and I can interchange on the fly with that hook. So, um, yeah, it's just it. This one I think would be really cool. You know, if people want to see that, we've we released a video on our YouTube channel, 
And then on our website, we've actually got banners that show the baits underwater. So you can actually see that neutral buoyancy um, in play there. It, uh, yeah, sure. Let me do this real quick. Yeah, I, I think like, you know, it really separates us when we're developing products is we've more focused on what the baits look like underwater than what they look like in the package. And most brands focus on what it looks like in the package at retail. And um, that's also why you see a lot of underwater footage from us and not a lot from other brands. It's like, you can see my screen right now. I can see it. Yeah. Okay. So like looking at it here, watching you drag this thing, like it doesn't really do a whole lot, but it just kind of like, scoots along on bottom and i think there's a drop shot clip here coming in a second yeah um but like if you were going to tell somebody to get confidence right there yeah if you were to tell somebody to get confidence in a helgramite when would you recommend they pick it up is it like a priest like almost like late pre-spawn kind of mayfly hatch time yeah, I, I would say like late pre-spawn is a good time throughout the entire summer. Um, it's really effective. I mean, I haven't in the fall, I've usually moved away from it a little bit, but definitely like, oh, I can't even say that. Honestly, it just catches them year round. I know that doesn't sound normal, but I think it's because they don't see it and they're just like, that's different. I'm going to eat it. And it can- it kind of you know, has like a, a like rocking motion, like a lot of, it, so like the Excite bait I, I helped with, like it has a ton of tail kick, right? It has just a ton of body movement, but like this just kind of like the whole bait just like undulates. I don't even know how to explain it other than just like the whole bait kind of moves like this. Yeah, it, it really doesn't do a whole lot. And honestly, like we've really dialed in these baits where we're almost looking for less is more and we're not trying to get a lot of wiggle. And if you yeah. look at most anglers, they've, they just want to like wiggle the crap out of their baits. And yeah. most often than not, just you holding the rod provides a lot of action. And um, yeah, I, I find less is more, you know, especially we'll, we'll pitch out to these fish and really just hold it. If we see the blob on the live scope, we'll just throw it right at them. And we just don't move it. And then they come over and you just feel the tick or the weight and you just load up. So I'm interested on that. So a lot of these guys, we're, we'll talk about hanging them in on real quick because like mid strolling, Demiki rigging, whatever you want to call it right now is, is a huge player, right? Well, a couple of years ago when you and I started talking, I, I fish a hair jig a lot. Okay. So like I'll throw a hair jig from 45 degrees until basically the mayfly hatch is done. Um, but the Cindy rig, which you told me about years ago, you're like, dude, it's going to outfish. It'll outfish a hair jig. Now you're seeing it, right? Like you're watching yeah. Luke Palmer crush it's guys. You did say that, rig. right? I, I told like, it is. You told me, you're like, dude, I'm not saying that you need to be throwing it, but it will outfish a hair jig. Like you fish it in the same areas, just a straight steady retrieve, like a hair jig and it will catch them all year long. And now like Luke Palmer is going to places where it shouldn't be probably working. And crushing them right like i say it shouldn't be working but like a lot of these guys are drop shotting or not drop shotting mid strolling like four to five plus inch baits and he's taking that little i have one here that little drop minnow on just a stealth ball head and just crawling it and it's no movement like he's not shaking it he's not doing anything nothing you literally just reel it back and <laughs> it's funny because i almost feel like everyone follows the crowd and I've been watching the elite series and these guys and everyone sees a fish and they just start shaking the crap out of their minnow. And I'm thinking, man, I bet. And you hear about it like, oh yeah, I mean, you know, not all of them are eating it. And I like from experience, I'm not saying at Toledo Bend cause I haven't done it there, but I feel like I've played with both and just straight reeling it back really does outfish the whole, like shaking it like crazy when the fish comes up to it and uh i know it sounds crazy but and i think that's why anglers don't do it because it almost seems like it, it should never work yeah it um, seems too dumb it, but it's like a hair jig right like you know you've you've done it enough right i'm sure yeah. you fished before you fished the cindy rig uh, people think i'm nuts when i say 
if you see a fish following it, the first thing you're going to want to do is like stop reeling your bait or shake yep. your bait or do something different, speed it up. That is the last thing you want to do. Like you just keep it coming and just, if they turn off it, just lead them back and just go again. Right. Yeah. Like it's crazy because it's the same, it's the same retrieve as the hair jig. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you why we even do it. Um, and this is a really good, like a funny story, but I would never have tried this unless I got a call from a good friend of mine. Um, his name's Steve Delia. He, he's older now. He, he's kind of retired from tournaments, but around here he used to be like a one of the top tournament anglers. And and him and I were on the Rapport Pro staff for years and became good friends. Well, I got a call from him one day and he was out with his wife, Cindy. And he was out on Lake Simcoe, which is legendary for giant smallmouth. And he called me and he couldn't believe it, but they were dragging to, he was dragging tubes and his wife, Cindy, who doesn't really know what she's doing. She was just at the back of the boat, casting the tube out and reeling it back straight, not doing anything. She was just kind of like going through the motions. Like and apparently she was like wrecking smallmouth, like 10 to one to his fish. And he was blown away by this. And um, so that was really the inspiration for attempting to just cast baits out and reel them back in because on Lake Simcoe, they're so pressured. It's super clear water. And if that's working there, then it's going to work everywhere. And, and that's where we really, really dialed in the whole like Cindy rig using the minnow um, and just making it that natural. Yeah. And that's why it's called the Cindy rig. So we, we called it that because we knew that no matter what, we could speak openly about the Cindy rig and no one would know what we're talking about. So if we're at the dock or whatever, yeah. like Cindy rig fish and people would have no clue what's going on. And, and then um, when Prad co-acquired Great Lakes Finesse, um, I, I told Luke Palmer and, and Jason Christie and Stetson, well, by the time they got a hold of these baits, it was so close to the northern swing. As you know, confidence is everything, and they only have so many days to pre-fish. So right. for, for Jason and Stetson, they just wanted more time with this stuff. Well, Luke had nothing to lose. He'd never made a cut before in the northern swing. So he went... I'm in like, I'm just going to listen to Dan. And he, I could tell when I met with those guys, he just absorbed all of the information. And then on his first event at St. Clair, he was leading going into the final day and he was fishing the most pressured area. Like there were all pretty much half the field was fishing where he was and he was leading. Really the only reason why Sifuentes won was because he made a huge run to the Canadian side and no one was around him. So he, he just had more fish. Um, that was, that's my belief anyway. And, um, but yeah, he was able to, and then the following event, I mean, he played, like he basically went in the Northern swing top 13 in all three events and then went yeah. to the event, used it there and got a six. So like his, after getting the Cindy rig in his hands and the drop minnow and understanding that bait, he ended up getting like really like four top 15s in four events at, at the elite level, which was awesome. So here's a question for you. Okay. So I, th I laughed so much or I thought it was so funny because my buddy, Josh, so I was bed fishing and I'm like picking off fish on beds and he didn't have a hair jig and I didn't happen to have any in the boat for some reason. He took a Ned rig, just like a ball head and then just rigged a Ned rig on the back. And all he would do is like cast it way out and just slow turn the handle. Yeah. And so for years I have a video um, from like four or five years ago, we call it Roman and Ned. Cause he, when I say he smashed them, I mean like, I was picking off the occasional bed fish and I was doing okay. He outfished me and then I just tried to do what he was doing. He smashed me. Yeah. So for years we were Roman and Ned. We'd take a uh, Z-Man, like do nothing dead plastic on the back and like basically a ball head jig and just roam it around like an eighth ounce and just roam it around. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's funny. That's funny. Yeah. I, I mean, story. There's, there's lots of, there's probably a lot of anglers that are like, Oh, I do this. And you know, that, we all keep these secrets and you know, it's funny when I started great lakes finesse, I used to think I knew all of the colors and had all the secrets. And then I started seeing all the tournament anglers place their orders through our website and everyone's literally fishing the exact same stuff. Like it was the same colors. They're all gravitating towards the same baits and we're all just doing the same thing. So but it's, it's funny because like, we're always looking for the secret thing or we're looking for like the, the special deal. I don't, I don't think that there really is a special deal. Like it's maybe there's something like maybe Kiyoya or like Taku have something special, but I think most of it is just pretty easy stuff. 
I think keeping it simple, like that's kind of our motto is keep it really simple and, and just gain confidence in something. And, um, you know, that's, that's just what we do. So like, I have a question for you. Are you just going to like, when you're doing the, the Cindy rig, are you going to use the ball head? Or are you going to switch up to like the hanging head or, or what? Yeah. So that, that's a great question. So the, the so, ball head. Yep. So that, okay, so that's so the hanging head. Hang head. Right. So that one is more designed for like offshore vertical, like straight vertical below the boat or pitching to them and then bringing it, swinging it back over their heads in deep water. Um, if I'm doing the Cindy rig, um, I'll either use the ball head, which is like this little guy here. And, yep. um, or something that we've been doing, we started cause we've got the sneaky underspin, which is this little bait, which you're well aware of. Oh, yeah. We started, we started cutting this off and using it as a straight head. And when, so that's new for us, we just released this product. So now we use, sometimes we'll use this head because it just looks a little bit more natural and it pairs with the drop middle. Like I can thread that on real quick. And, so um, cause that it has just, what, like a 60 degree tie on it. So it's it does. Line forward. Yep, exactly. So it's gonna, it's gonna be, so there's a few things that make that. So that's kind of what it looks like with the, with the head on it. Oh yeah. Okay. Oops, I'm really bad at this. I gotta get better at it. Um, <laughs> but so the so the uh, that's something that you notice there is the eye is right at the front of the head, and that's really intentional. Um, oh, I have that right here. Yeah, I, I think we. Should. Yeah, so that's the, yeah, so that so that one with the black drop minnow is gonna be insane. Like I'm telling yeah. you right now, you're gonna love fishing that head. Um, so there's a, a couple things that separate the ball head from from this guy. So one is the eyes at the front. So if you're around any vegetation, you're not going to get any weeds caught in this little gap. So all of the heads that have the, the eye kind of in the middle of the head, if you get through some milfoil or whatever, and you rip it through, sometimes you get little pieces of weed stuck in that little piece. This head doesn't do that. So it allows you to kind of be on those weed lines or sparse vegetation, pull it through. I mean, if you're a walleye angler, it's incredible. Um, and then the second thing is for little swim baits and for like um, like little 2.5 to 2.8 Kitex or, you know, whatever swim bait you like, Rhythm Waves, Jackal uh, Rhythm Waves or Haze Dong Shads, throw it on there. It's going to swim more consistently horizontal through the water. So um, the other thing that is interesting, well, not interesting, intentionally done is if you're going to this realistic minnow profile head, and we're fishing super clear water like our setup generally is five pound test braid to like four or six pound fluoro so this hook is still a gamagatsu hook but it's intentionally uh, a finer wire hook so that you don't have to like really set hard and what we're finding with the thicker gauge hooks on the market if we're bombing that way out there on our like seven six to eight foot custom rods that we have that are medium light fast if that fish, which generally the biggest fish are the ones that hit further away from the boat, if we set the hook with light line and those whip your rods, those thicker gauge hooks, we just couldn't get really good penetration and they were shaking the bait. So this finer wire hook, you just kind of like reel into them, kind of like the underspin. You probably understand that. You just reel into them. You sweep kind of like a drop shot. Is this the same hook as the underspin? Yes, it's the exact same hook. Yeah. And then the hanging head is a different hook. It's a little same. bit. Oh, same hook. Same, okay. yeah. It, that, I think that's There's a two, that's a two hook. Yeah. I yeah. got you. Yeah. Sorry, no. That's the um. That's a one odd hook. I apologize. That's a one odd uh, gamma god to fine wire. That's cool. So yeah, those are the differences. So if you look at the two heads, um, let me show this. So if you see the two heads, let me put it right in front. Oh man, I'm really bad at this. So you can see that. So the hanging head, which is this guy, the eye is further back. So it's perfectly balanced more for dropping down and keeping it above their heads and then having your bait sit perfectly level in the water. So you can use pretty much any plastic on this, but naturally we're going to pair it with our drop minnow. And then this one is more for that casting and horizontal presentation because we're moving that bait 
more like towards us, generally shallower, or just keeping it higher in the water column and fan casting with it. So those are the two, the separators there in those two heads. That's cool. And why they're needed. That's cool. Yeah. And then they're all powder coated and baked, which is something that we do most, most just paint and then yeah. coat it with something. Our, our powder coat will basically be like no chip. So you can bang it off rocks all day, drag it on the bottom. Um, so they're a little bit more pricier than the, like the average jig head, but those are just painted offshore. You know, we like in the manufacturing, we protect the eye. So you can see that this right out of the pack. Oh man, I'm really bad at this. Right out of the package, um, that eye isn't painted. So you can get away with like light line. And because it's powder coated and baked, if we didn't protect the eye in the manufacturing, you would never be able to break that paint. And even if you did, it would be so sharp that you wouldn't be able to use like four or six pound test line. So there's just a lot of premium that goes into our heads and like on the sneaky underspin, the hanging head and, <clears throat> and the swim bait head. That's like any of the guys that make their own tackle. So like I know Jig Squad Cuda brand was in here earlier. Um, he has this thing that he does where he co covers the eye with like shrink, uh, heat shrink. And he taught mm -hmm. me that. And that's such a big deal because if you don't do that, like when you're fishing, whatever, right. Whether it's this head or it's something you make or a hair jig and it's not a bare hook. Like yeah. I don't care if it's paint or if it's powder, like that's just an extra thing that you can cut your line on i've seen it i've seen it enough times on like a hair jig or a small swim bay head and like you br continually break off right at the eye and then you start to yep. look and it's because you did a poor job of cleaning the eye or keeping it clean so yeah exactly it's so important and even if you do get it clean if you're using some kind of kind of tool you nick the inside of the eye you create a sharp edge it, you know you might not even realize it until you go to set the hook in the tournament and you're wondering what the heck just happened um so um, and then the I do other have a thing question is, for you. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, because the, what are your thoughts on eyes on a bait? Do you think they matter? Do you think they don't matter? Or in pressured situations, it matters, or it doesn't matter, or do you not really care uh, too much one way or another? Depends. I mean, the stealth ball head is is a proven winner. It has no eyes. I think it's probably maybe a self-confidence thing and and like i said earlier self-confidence in what you're doing is is huge it certainly doesn't hurt if it if it's done appropriately right if you have the right trailer i don't think it hurts to have eyes um yeah. but do i think that it's the end all be all i mean if you know early prototypes of the underspin that we were doing before like i mean now they're super glued on and uh, everything but we were just kind of like taking them like sticker eyes and put them on there and you know, lose one after a fish and we'd still be crushing fish without eyes on it. So, I mean, it, I think it, it doesn't hurt for sure. I mean, I've, I've yet to see a scenario where it doesn't like, it doesn't hurt you to have them, but I can't say for sure. Like I can't, say I was just, sure. I was just curious. I wasn't sure if it was one of those things you were like, I know some guys are dead set on it. Like with a swim jig, I'm pretty much dead set on like, I need eyes on a swim jig for some reason. Like, it's the flash of those eyes. I don't know. Yeah, it might be yeah. a confidence thing, but for me, it's like the deal. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I mean, everything that we make when we're designing the stuff. I mean, we're basically just like for me personally, like selfishly, I'm just trying to design stuff to help me win tournaments. So if we're putting them on there, it's because I feel like it it will help. Um. So yeah, I mean. I, I think so. I think it it can't hurt. So when do you drop down to four pound leader? Uh, T T one D Steve asks that. If I cast at a fish and it doesn't bite, I'm going down. <laughs> um, and I feel like I've got the right bait on. So if I know, like if I'm catching fish, like sometimes I'll actually have rods with different pound test lines. So like I'll usually, if I'm in a tournament, I usually want to try to hook them on the stiffer line, like you know, six or eight pound. But if I know it's a big fish or I know that we're on a school that maybe is getting a little bit more pressured, I'll like sometimes we'll go down a three pound test. I mean, it's, a, it sounds so crazy, but that's really why you're seeing the finer wire hooks in, in a lot of the stuff we make and these super clean eyes is because we actually use three and four pound test. 
and I really picked that up when I was a steelheader. Like I grew up on the river fishing steelhead and and using size like little tiny hooks and four pound test line and catching 20 pound fish. So I'm super comfortable for people who don't steelhead. That seems so crazy. But for like anyone who grew up fly fishing or steelheading, it's completely reasonable to have that, that pound test. As so, long as you're on the bottom. When you're, is there like a specific type line or like a brand line that you recommend? Like when you go down that light, you have to be pretty particular, right? Because one line diameter, but two, like, yeah, here I'll grab one. I actually got, I got my tackle bag because I figured you might have questions about stuff. Um, so here, this is one that I use. Um, let me take it out of the package. It's pretty expensive. But this is actually a line that I gained a lot of confidence when I was younger as a fly fly fisherman and a steelheader. Okay. And it's called Drennan fluorocarbon. And uh, this stuff is, like, unbelievable. I and mean, it's not marketed to bass anglers at all. And I just... I've tried a lot of the bass stuff and I don't know. I just think that the fly anglers, like because they generally use super light line and that line has to be really good for like fly anglers are the most anal people on the planet. So yeah. it's gotta be good or they're going to get destroyed. So oftentimes I look into like, you know, fly fishing stuff or line or, you know, technology or whatever that's happening. Cause like I tried to go below, <laughs> I tried to go to five pound last year and I got some, I don't know if it was Sunline or if it was Daiwa. And I love Sunline for the most part at like seven pound and up, but when you even six pound is fine. But like you start to go below six pound test. I almost agree. Like it's just not really built for bass fishing and as good as it might be, like I just really struggled. I was like losing fish that I didn't think I should have lost. I mean, maybe I should have retired a little bit more, but yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, like I, when I used to work for Rapala, like we had suffix line, and even then, like suffix fluorocarbon was great. But once you got into like into those lower pound test lines, like it just not compete with the fly lines that are out there. And um, yeah, like that Drennan stuff is really expensive, but it it's incredible. And I've pretty much won, like I mean, all of my money in tournaments on that Drennan fluoro. Is yeah. that what you used last year on the St. Lawrence? So for people who don't yeah. know, Dan. How much did you weigh? Like 30, was it 30, 32, four. That's crazy. Yeah. In July. So like, what were you, can I ask what, like, what were you fishing? Was it any of this stuff that you just kind of, uh, so for that tournament, it was mainly the drop minnow. We mixed in the snack craw, um, the, like the juvie craw, which we'll talk about, wasn't quite dialed in at that point. Um, and the Helger might, like we, we just knew that they were going to eat the drop minnow and we're also using the underspin. So for that tournament, um, there was a mix of like spawners and post spawners. And I feel like there was also a mix of some, some that were coming up looking for males. And, um, and we found that some of the biggest fish were actually not on the beds. And most of the anglers in the tournament were targeting the beds. And we found that we were getting around beds, but there was these, there was these giant cruisers, they were so hard to catch and that's when we, we we really used the drop minnow and went down to super light line and we every spot that we caught those fish in there was guys around us do you think they were post spawners or you think they were just big like pre-spawn females like cruising or pre -spawn pre -spawn and like we got so don't get me wrong we did catch a couple fish were on beds but we also right. mixed yeah, in some cruisers. Mix like that's the yeah. thing with small like so the reason i'm asking i have a tournament in it's June 6th or June 9th or whatever. It's that Sunday. And I know there's going to be a mix of you're going to have to have like two fish that you pick off a of bed first thing. And then you just have to go fish, right? Like you just have to go fish through. So like you have to find that right mix of fish. Um, yeah. So like when you're doing this, what are you targeting? Like, how are you trying to trick these fish? And like, how do you trick a fish that, because we've all seen it, you get up on the shallow sand flat, like it's a spawning flat but you see those cruisers that are near impossible sometimes. Like what are you? Yeah. So for, so for us, it's, and it's always been, this is kind of like our, like we're so dialed into the super finesse stuff for us. It's really long rods, super light line and maximizing our casts and getting it out as far as we possibly can, because we find, we find that the biggest fish, it doesn't matter. Like if we could cast another 20 feet, we would take it because 
we know that the further away we are from those big fish, the higher a percentage chance of catching those fish. So that's really for us what the difference is, is light line and really micro baits that no one's throwing. Like what, what kind of rod are you using? Are you going longer than a seven, six, like medium light or, or light? Pulse? Yeah. So, so I actually have a custom made North Fork blank rod. That's eight foot. Um, okay. I got one here. I'll just one second. Uh, We're seeing the sneaky stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is like pretty, pretty next level. So this is an eight foot rod um actually the guy who started the company it's so long it's like touching the ceiling but um it's look we intend like this rod has really high components like a north fork blank yeah. and then the other thing that we do is these um, microwave guides from uh so i know they look yeah, really american good. Tackle. american tackle so we made these rods because these guides like i've tested them i know those guys i i tried when i tried these at icast so those are legit legit yeah it's funny because so so many companies went away from them uh, so i'm a, a huge believer like it, it will on light line you will absolutely get longer distances oh, guaranteed that's amazing yeah so really long rot microwave guides um five pound test braid and i'm able to outcast anyone like i i can outcast my competitor 20 feet 30 feet i'm a cast is it like a light plus is it like in between a medium light and a Light uh, or like it's a medium light fast like it, it's got backbone <clears throat> so that's like my like my longest rod um that I, i'll use i got like four of those that were custom made for this technique but then you know like a seven six medium light um there's some some rods on the market that that you can fit like you don't need an eight foot rod i mean this is just like right. i'm going extreme right like i'm looking for i'm not saying i'm catching 20 more fish than everyone else i'm catching one more fish or two yeah more. So exactly that's the difference between winning and losing at these high levels is that extra yeah. fish? yeah so that's crazy so how long is your leader like when you're fishing do you run a top shot is it like just a normal standard like 15 like 10 to 15 foot leader like what how long is your leader when you're, you're tying for, on uh, for a drop shot or for casting no leader? i mean like you're you're uh leader line on like a uh, cindy rig or something um usually like no longer than the length of the rod that's okay. usually enough for so me. it's just like a normal like standard yeah yeah there's no and sometimes it gets real short because i'm just lazy and i don't want to retie anyone like if, if i'm in a tournament i'll retie them but um you know anything really north of like four feet is fine of line that's i find cool. yeah if i'm fun fishing or whatever like i get pretty lazy that's cool yeah. yeah, I wasn't sure if it was something sneaky too. No, nothing so, sneaky. Like, li like literally, it's just about maximizing the distance in the clear water for me. I feel that. Mm -hmm. So we kind of talked the hanging minnow or the hanging head and, and whatnot. I'm really curious. So I put the juvie craw in the thumbnail because it's probably the most um, interesting craw bait or interesting tube that's come out in like ten years. Or ever yeah like, kind of explain this one to me so obviously you can fish it like a tube but what caught my eye was you swim in the craw yeah so i mean this is like a typical you know two and a half inch or two seven five tube um but the thing is like every smallmouth angler fishes tubes and for me like i'll play with the tentacles i'll rip them off and i kind of got into this you know, technique where I'd rip half the tentacles off on each side and try to almost mimic claws and whiskers. Like I was ripping them, but it still looked really dumb. And I just realized like they love cross. Like they just, everywhere we go, um, like even, like even the snack craw, I mean, that's a, a little craw and that was, you know, intentionally designed to like, to be fished on the bottom um, and drag. But I just felt like if we could actually make a small juvenile crop like profile but not make it too realistic because like you said like some of the dumbest stuff works and like our stuff really like if you don't really know about it it doesn't look the sexiest uh, like on the shelf you know what i mean but we're so focused on making sure the baits catch fish so it was a, a fine line between like making a cross style tube also for us it was being able to get away with a thicker gauge tube hook um 
and be able to drag it, you know, out of deep water or whatever. And then the nice thing about the tube is it just collapses down, right? So you get such a big gap. And if you can get that into a smallmouth, you're just so much more likely to land them than on a smaller hook with a like an actual big like bait, um, like a thicker material. So like really and then also like we a tube most of the time doesn't have floating most of it's salted right so it doesn't it just kind of flops on the bottom it like rolls over and you know we solved some of the problems with the rolling with our mini pro tube head which has become a top seller like a tackle warehouse and omni or wherever you go like it's literally a top seller for them yeah we can't make we can't pour those fast enough so we were like let's develop a bait like we we were getting asked honestly it was like 10 people a day minimum saying what tube should I use? And will you guys come up with a tube? And so we had an idea for this, but I just, we weren't just going to release another tube. You know what I mean? Like we knew we could release a, like we could do this in no time. Like this isn't anything exciting. It's just a tube, but we were like, let's do it right. Let's do a GLF style. And let's, let's take, let's take this category to a new level. And as soon as we started fishing it, we were like, Oh my, like not only, is it cooler looking but it actually catches more fish like we were testing it like we, i want to know like, is this thing gonna outfish a regular tube that i have a lot of confidence in and it absolutely does and not only does it have a lot of it catch a lot of fish like the landing ratio is insane and it held up like crazy like we were catching like you would think these little tentacles would tear off but they weren't um in so the claws so that's that's one of the craziest things that i didn't realize when i first started fishing the glf stuff was like I fish a finesse football a lot, a lot. I mean, like, I love a finesse football. But you start rigging a snack craw, and I wasn't using a snack craw to start. You start fishing a snack craw, and it's like you'll catch 10 plus fish on one snack craw, and then you're like, oh, it's kind of beat up. Like, maybe I guess I'll replace it. But like, other baits just don't hold up like that. I don't, I didn't really understand that until I actually put it on there. But like, you can put a lot of pressure on this thing, and it's not tearing apart yeah like you like i in testing we caught hundreds of smallmouth on these and that was never an issue like with the tearing of the the claws or anything so yeah really really good and like we just launched this bait yesterday and like all the dealers sold out immediately i had a dealer call me today and he said that people were literally fighting he had to break up a grown man fight at the local <laughs> dealer here and he said he's never seen anything like it. It was absolutely nuts. Um, well, so people are excited about it. It also is unique, right? Like a craw, a claw or a tube, excuse me, has sort of that glide to it and the tentacles kind of move. But like what I find super interesting is in this video, like you can see it almost like like there. It has that kick and like undulation like a crawfish. So yeah, like, yeah it's a tube, but it's also like, and that and that's the buoyant material there in there which keeps the claws up a little bit longer so those claws will actually lift and the tentacles will lift so if it's say you're dead sticking it the tentacles lift up like like kind of like this and that's like it drives them nuts so the, your your standard tube all the tentacles just flop on the on the ground right this like these ones kind of lift and the claws lift a little bit so so i've heard so I watch you guys like you and Matt uh, Dobson and um, Travis go over and fish St. Lawrence and, and over in Ontario, like where you guys are fishing. Let's start to talk about some strategy, right? Like watching you guys catch these fish, you're targeting pre-spawn, like these shallow flats. Kind of walk me through like where are you going to look early this spring? And, like where's this tube going to play most for you? Because like I can think of some of my areas like lead-ins to big spawning bays. You have these yeah. rock flats that fall off into like in the sand with mixed cover, right? Like, yeah, is it going to be the same stuff for you guys? I've heard my buddy Adam Valley talk to a couple guys that live over on Ontario, and he's telling me it's like crazy some of these areas that you guys fish. It, yeah, like, so the one thing about that time of the year is, first of all, um they're not always in the same spot. They really move around a lot. Uh, water temp is a big thing for us. So we're always kind of on the hunt for better water temp. And generally we're trying to like find shallow areas that have good, like warmer water and they seem to school up there. But um, 
you know, any transition areas from deep water into those spawning bays, like really the spawning bays is kind of where they're going, right? They're going to go there and they're going to hang out pretty much till they spawn at this point. So finding those areas that typically they spawn in and then working my way backwards is, is what we're looking for. I won't, I won't start out with the, the juvie craw. I'm always going to start with the sneaky underspin because at the, like when I get to the lake, I've got to cover water and I got to move fast. So we'll, it's almost like finesse power fishing with that bait. And they just, I haven't, I've yet to find a bait that they eat better than that bait. Like if, if there's fish around, even if there's only one, it's going to eat the sneaky underspin. So I'll just cover water and then we'll kind of see it. Like as we're getting closer to the juice, we'll start to see it. Like we'll catch one and then we'll move another 20 yards. We'll catch, Oh, now we got two on the underspin. And all of a sudden we'll kind of get into an area and it's just like one after another. And if you go to like the small crush videos, you'll actually see yeah. us tripling up nonstop. And that's because the sneaky underspin led us to that area. And then once we know where they are, that's when I'm going to switch to like, typically we'd use the snack craw. They love the little craw and I've seen it. So like we started exploring there really early, like before boats were even getting on the water and um, going to like boat launches and stuff. And something that I noticed pretty early was like little craws starting to walk around, but really slow and really lethargic and like super defenseless. So like that kind of caught me onto the craw style. And then, you know, obviously the tube style craw, the juvie craw now is going to be a, a huge player. So yeah, like Matt is like, just like, he's already rigging rods and he's just like, oh, he's got all the colors. <laughs> like he's ready to go and throw this tube. Um, yeah, th this juvie craw is going to be, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be unbelievable. For that. So the sneaky is interesting because like when I first started throwing the sneaky and you told me throw it in like the cleanest, the cleaner, the better. Like if they can see it, they're going to eat it. But it feels so weird. Like even if you love throwing hair and you love to throw like a small ball head, like throwing the sneaky feels kind of weird when you're throwing it in bath water, right? But there's something about that thing that just gets so many bites. When you start picking it up, like anyone that hasn't fished it, I think a lot of people think I'm trying to sell them on this thing. It doesn't take any selling. Like you just start fishing it and you'll get a you'll get a bite. And you're like, okay, I'm starting to understand. Like I don't it doesn't take a lot of brain power. Then you fish it again and you like get more bites on that thing. And it starts to get to a point where it's just a confidence, like covering water for smallmouth. Like you just want to see where they live. Um, yeah like so the sneaky underspin like i just i just literally clipped this off one of my rods here this little guy here this is my confidence one black matte black with a black minnow drop minnow um if you were to say hey like you can never fish anything again except for one bait what are you going to throw and it will be the sneaky underspin like that is for anything like it doesn't even need to be bass it could be walleye brook trout panfish whatever like if I'm going to a lake and I have no idea what swims on that lake, I'm going to throw the sneaky underspin. Like I discovered a lake up near my cottage. I had no idea what was in it. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to throw the underspin. Literally like in three casts, I cut two brook trout. And I'm like, there we go. Like I know there's brook trout in here. So the sneaky underspin will not only tell up, tell you if there's fish around, it's going to tell you what kind of species are around. Um, so you, it kind of takes a lot of that work. And the nice thing about that bait is you can take anyone fishing with you and they can just cast that out. Like I've had camera guys with me who like we're done filming and they don't really know how to fish too well. And I'm like, here's a sneaky understanding. They're <laughs> wrecking fish because there's, you don't need to know how to do anything. You just cast it out, reel it back. That's it. Do you have a key? So I think <clears throat> maybe it was my buddy that posted a, a Instagram story about which color sneaky he should buy, like which color blade, right? Like, I have my own rule of thumb, but like, what is your rule of thumb with blade color? You always start with silver or like overcast. You start with gold or water clarity. You choose one or the other. Like, what is your kind of recommendation? On so, that? so yeah, I'm always learning. Like I, I've been fishing this style of bait for a long time. Had you asked me this question prior to last summer, I would have said silver, like just buy silver. You'll be good to go. I would mix in the gold occasionally for, my theory on that was, okay, if it's overcast or if I'm in slightly stained water where the light penetration isn't as great, I'm going to go with the gold. Well, my opinion on that actually changed a little bit last year. 
we started to mix in the gold a little bit more. And one day we just like, I was fishing the gold, Matt was fishing the silver. And it was just like really noticeable that the gold was getting more bites. And we didn't feel that our typical thought process of what we thought we understood wasn't necessarily true. And so he switched to the gold. And then now if it's not 50, 50, like I would say that like, I'd be shocked if I don't throw the gold first this year. Like if I'm going to take my first cast of sneak ender spin, it's probably going to be a gold blade this year, no matter the case. Super interesting. It's crazy. It's changed my whole, I'm always learning. And like you learn every day on the water and I by no means know everything about smallmouth. I like, I'm, I always keep an open mind because there's just so much we don't know. And, but yeah, the gold blade has really become a big player for me. It's funny because for me, it was always like water clarity. So like, I think about it similar to the way I think about blade bait fishing, right? Like I'm fishing a blade. If the water's clean and they're feeding on, you know, small bait fish or whatever, I'm, I'm throwing silver. And then if it's like tannic or a little bit off color water or they're feeding on perch, uh, I'll throw the gold. Right. And now it's like, it's almost 50 50. Like I start to mix in the gold a lot more than I used to mix it in in places where I'm like, man, the gold is kind of a bigger player than I ever expected it to be. So I haven't really it, mixed it. Really in is. I think sometimes we uh, underspin though. I think sometimes as anglers, we try to overanalyze things and convince ourselves of reasons why we need to be using things. And I, I feel like the gold blade is a really good example of how sometimes we're just overthinking it and um yeah for me the gold blade is is it's a big player now for me how'd you come up with the sneaky like how um, long has that been a thing that you've been fiddling with and, and like winning money on uh for a while like for a lot like we kept it a like an absolute secret so um really it was inspired from a lot of the baits coming out of the southern u.s like underspins on hartwell and stuff have always kind of been around um California there's some really good like underspins that you know the problem is like even when you get into those finesse ones and um another brand just released one like one of the big YouTube groups they just released one as well but for us like you're gonna get bites on all these like little finesse underspins um they're they're good like there's some good ones but the problem is that you're not gonna land all your fish and for me I'm in the game of not just getting bites but landing the fish because those are really important for me and for those southern largemouth it makes sense to have a thicker gauge hook so for the markets they're intended for for spotted bass or largemouth absolutely they've made the right decision by going with a thicker gauge hook often those companies are using like a must add ultra point or something or yeah um, but for us we learned pretty quickly that that hook we were, it was a heartbreaker it was almost like fishing a frog in pads like we were just losing too many smallmouth on I'm not saying you're going to lose smallmouth if you use the baits with, you know, thicker line and stiffer rods. Like if you use a medium, if you if you're like I am not going to use four pound tests, I you can't convince me I'm going to use eight to ten pound tests and a medium rod for smallmouth. Then absolutely you can use a thicker gauge hook. For us though, with the rod I just showed you and the line we use, there's absolutely no way that we can land fish effectively with a thicker gauge hook. That's funny. And, yeah. I uh so when I originally started working with TFO, Ross Evans from TFO reached out and was like, Hey, we want to design some more small mall specific stuff. Right. They're a company from Texas too. They work with Cliff Pace. A lot of their rods were like more large mall focused. Well, the rod they wanted to work with me on originally was a hair jig rod. And even like their seven, six medium light was had too much backbone. And so essentially you'd pull hooks on a hair jig. Like guys, I, I don't know how to explain this other than it just needs to be like almost parabolic. Yeah. Like softer enough where I don't even need to really set the hook. It just kind of loads into the fish and like rubber band affects them. Yeah. But with a hair jig and I don't like to say there's not a lot of great hair jigs out there. Like you have to kind of know somebody to make you a hair jig or make your own or like. A hundred percent. There just weren't a lot of great hair jigs because the hook was too thick. So like you use that soft rod so you can land a lot of the fish, but then you weren't landing a lot of the fish because you're not driving the hook home. Yeah. Right. Like when you start, when I started fishing this stuff and 
again, I'm not trying to be like a salesperson here, but when you start fishing the Great Lakes stuff, it's all like lighter wire hooks. Like you can drive the hook home on a medium light seven six. Like it, it's just very interesting the way that the thought process is there because it kind of aligns with the stuff that I'm pouring in my garage for all these years that I had to make myself because like it's also tournament minded stuff where instead of it just being you know, we're pouring a bait with a mustad hook. Like we're pouring a bait with Gamagatsu light wire because I want to hook and actually land all of my fish instead of 100%. I need to force it to the boat. It, so it, it's it's cool like, to hear like the tournament mindset of like hook to land ratio, whether you're a tournament fisherman or just a fun dude. Like I want to land, I want to have a high 90% land percentage. Like, I mean, for me, I always, that was something that I always really focused on. Like I'm always trying to com, com, control variables, the landing percentage, no matter what bait I was always using, I was always just trying to figure out how do I land even one more fish a day. And for me, it's a whole system, right? Like it's the bait, this hook. Yeah. I mean, that seems so simple, light wire hook, but that's because I know I'm going to be faced with situations where I need long rods, long cast, big fish. I'm not going to be able to drive a hook hard into a fish. So I'm going to need that light wire. Like it's all, it's just part of the system. Like it's not like a one size fits all. And, you know, I think when anglers start fishing a lot of this stuff, as they start to explore the super finesse game and realize like with all this forward facing sonar and then all the pressure these fish are getting, this is going to be a technique that they're going to start to gain confidence in. They're going to have to really learn how to, to fish super finesse. Like, Finesse is, is a loose term in this industry. Like people just, you know, big companies who have big, big baits, they'll make a small version of a bait and call themselves finesse. And that's really, finesse is a whole different beast and category. And, and really we're focused on just owning the finesse, super finesse category and being the authority on just how not only to like, not only provide baits that work, but also education on like how to fish the baits. Because once you explore that, it's super fun. Well, even so, this is going to sound really dumb, but let me grab a bit. Okay, so like even grabbing like the snack craw, that was really, other than the sneaky, which like was super easy, you just pick it up and start throwing it around and you'll get bites. But like even the snack craw, to understand like this is a small cross style bait. So I didn't understand originally um, the OW Sniper from Beast Coast. So like it took me a little bit to get and kind of understand that bait. I was fishing too big of a trailer. I was doing too many things. I wasn't fishing in the right places or whatever. But like even go into something more finesse or as finesse as a snack craw, like it almost there's a learning curve to learning this bait that starts to open doors into other products because a lot of people think okay I'm gonna pick up a snack craw, I'm gonna go out and immediately start catching fish, but there is a learning curve to, to start catching fish and to understand, okay, like the snack craw is the gateway drug and to go in and fish in the flat cat, which is the gateway drug. Yeah. To go and fish. Like it sounds really dumb and it sounds really easy, but there's a lot of actual technique that goes into starting to learn how to manage and use the bait effectively because you it's look funny. at flat it's cat. Funny you say that. That's hilarious. Cause that, that is exactly how it is. Like the flat cat is just, or sorry, the, the snack craw is a much more palatable, bait to try yeah you put it on the back of a finesse jig yeah and you're like okay like i start to understand and then you're like okay the finesse jig's too much today like i need to downsize and go to the yeah. stealth head and then you're like oh shoot okay like the snack craw is too much today i need to downsize and go to the stealth head with a flat cat <laughs> like yeah like it's funny because the flat cat like if you were to ask the best fishermen that fish our baits and are affiliated with us like pretty much unanimously they all feel like the flat cat's the best bait in the lineup but it's, but the it's, dumb. Like, it's weird to fish it's, it's almost yeah. really weird to fish the flat cat because i didn't fish literally had five or six packs maybe put it on one time and i'm like i don't really get how to fish this thing no like, and it looks dumb like it, it's it like super you look super at it and you're like no no there's no way <laughs> and you're fishing it around cool. and you're like no confidence you're like i don't get this is so stupid it, and you put the snack craw on and you start getting bites and you feel good like it, it's so dumb like if you, even if you put on a drop shot it looks so dumb 
I don't have that much confidence yet. <laughs> like it, it takes time. Like it's, it really truly is a, if you know, you know, and I think that's why the hardcore tournament anglers love it because the average angler will just never get to the point where they understand this bait. So they know like that the no one's fishing rig. around it. The Cindy it really, rig is anything. It truly is like the Cindy rig. Like you, if is. you do it and you just trust the process, like you start to build the confidence to be able to do it. But if you don't do it and you don't see it. So like I fish the flat cat, um, pretty much any time those fish start to get up on the sand flats, like that's where I started to learn the power of that thing. I'll put it on a stealth ball, um, cast it up on the sand flat. And like the fish would just show up from places. And yeah. then you start to see the power of the bait and what it's doing. And you're like, okay, now I can start to expand it outside of just that application. But it's really weird how hard it is to learn a finesse technique. It It's crazy. Like I would say the flat cat, sells really really well but to far fewer anglers so what i mean is like when an angler buys this bait they're not buying one pack like they're clearing the whole rack like that like i had an opens angler last year um i think they were fishing i think it was oneida and he messaged us saying like frantically needing them and he was willing to drive like eight hours and forego a day of practice to get flat cats like it was like if you know, you know, and you almost, it's such a dumb bait. You, you almost need someone to catch fish in front of you on it for you to like have the confidence to throw it. But it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Once you understand it, it, it is truly an incredible bait. So let's kind of move from the, the flat cat back to the cross style baits. Okay. So a tube, I still want to say like, I understand the power of a tube. I've seen guys wreck my face with the tube. But I don't like when are you picking up the juvie craw or tube over like a small finesse craw on a ball head? That's a really great question. Um, I feel like the tube bait just does a few different things. Like, you know, you'll get some air bubbles coming out of it. Um, the nice thing about it, a tube bait is like, say, I want to fish scent or, you know, get some, like, I like you can shove some cotton in here and like load it up with scent or, um, you know, I, th I think too, like part of it is a lot of people just have a lot of confidence in tubes. So I think that this will be a, a little easier for people to understand and really get into the finesse game because it's a really powerful bait. People already fish tubes. Um, the snack craw, like this thing is just a, a different profile. So I would say like there isn't a scenario where I'll choose one or the other, but I'll fish them the same day if I'm on a pile of fish and I just want to give them a different look. So like, I don't know if you want to pull up our website. There's a, like, you can actually see the claws. Like this thing doesn't look like much, but one it's it's matte finish. But what we did with the buoyancy was we put just enough in here where it doesn't actually sit straight up. It sits on more of a 45 degree angle. So the claws oh, yeah. just kind of have this really cool lift. So, you know, by watching these smallmouth for years and years, like I've been tournament fishing for well over 20 years now, like you just watch these smallmouth follow the baits, nose down, look at them, and those claws, as soon as they do this, they just come in and suck it up. Um, so that little action there, that little lift is what triggers them with this bait. You kind of like, you pull it, it go, they go down, and then they just lift. And they always face the fish. And that's that's the magic of this bait. And it is, it is a very different look. Like there's something about this bait. It's like, I don't want to say a flat cat does really nothing, but like that bait, those claws standing up, that to me was like a deal. Yeah. Like if you like, so this is completely different. Like if you go over to the flat cat, you can see that video now and show people what that looks like. It almost looks like a little goby scooting along the bottom yeah. or yeah. like it could be, I don't know what they're thinking it is. It could be a leech. But, you know, let their – who cares what they think it is, right? It really doesn't matter. <laughs> but that's, like, the look um, that you're getting out of the bait right there. So that little – it's just a different look. And, and all these smallmouth are different. They're all – you know, some days are super aggressive, but some days are really finicky, and we'll rotate through these baits. So like, that day where we broke the record on the St. Lawrence with that monster bag, I mean, we beat everyone by over five pounds. Um, we were just rotating through these baits to trigger those big ones. Um <laughs> So, but really the drop minnow and the, um, the snack rod did the damage. That's so interesting. Yeah. So I got a question for you is if you're going to pick up, 
if Dan Miguel is going to rig up for like a pre-spawn, spawn mix, post-spawn tournament, like what colors are you going to rig up? What's going to be probably your first cast and what's going to be like your go-to? Like okay, so sorry, pre-spawn? Yeah, like pre-spawn into the spawn. Like you have some fish staging up and then you have fish spawning. So right around the shallow flat. Yeah, so I mean 100% the sneaky underspin. Like you're going to cruise around. Um, I'll definitely have the snack craw. It's just we've caught more fish over seven pounds on that bait than anything else. Do you have so a favorite know, color? Is it just green pumpkin? Or? Yeah, so the green pumpkin is probably the one we use the most. But something that we had last year that no one else had was this green pumpkin purple, which is a sneaky – I don't know if you can see it. You have some, I think. Did yeah. You said yep. Yeah. Yep. And this color we had as well. Um but it's like a green pumpkin. It's like a brown orange. It's it's not like a bright orange. I don't know if you yeah. can see that in the one you have, but that color is really good. So I will have probably those and then a black one tied on. Um, and then I'll, I'll definitely have a juvie craw on just because if I can get away with it, the I would rather catch them on the juvie craw because the, the hook, like our mini pro tube head hook is slightly thicker gauge. And in that case, I'll actually use like a seven, eight medium heavy rod. And this hook can handle that. And I'd rather, if they're biting the tube or that style of bait, I'd rather get them on this hook because it's a short shank and it's almost like fishing a jig. Like they just don't come off this. So then I'll I'll start there if I can get them to bite the juvie craw. If they're not biting that, I'll use a snack craw. Um, but I'll also have a drop minnow tied. I know it sounds like I have like the whole arsenal, but it is true. <laughs> but, <laughs> If you if you legit saw us in tournaments, you would be like, "Wow, you just fish just the GLF line." Like it, it, but it's because we're making baits for ourselves that we want in tournaments. It's not because like, you know, like these are just gap fillers for us, and you know, especially if we're not going to be fishing a jerk bait or chatter bait or something like. Don't get me wrong, like we're going to fish a jerk bait if the situation is right for that, um, but. If we can catch them on this finesse stuff, our landing pre percentage is super high. Well, it's really funny because the jerk bait is good. So we have a lot of like really, really clean water fisheries. And so like you'll get to places where you almost can't fish a jerk bait. You, ha you have to fish like either something swimming up in the column, a swim bait, a hair jig, a whatever, whatever. You have to fish something swimming. Like you can't fish a jerk bait. The water clarity is not right. And like you guys – places you guys fish is it all like the st lawrence where it's pretty clear or do you guys have like off colored tea colored bodies of water too over there yeah so the st lawrence is like generally very clear and then you know like some like a bunch of my trophies here are on on like a lake called rice lake which is oh, yeah. it's killer but it's like super dirty like most often for us like surface clarity is like six inches to a foot and uh so a lot of these colors like the black um the green pumpkin purple um green pumpkin red like those dark really dark colors i mean really it's there but i'm just kind of like thinking as i'm talking through this really the same colors i'm using in clear water um they just seem to work in both spots i'm thinking about it but you know another sneaky color is this like motor oil color yeah um, yeah but to answer your question like I don't know most of the time we're fishing clear now because we just love fishing the st lawrence and i mean that's still a two-hour drive for us but we'll go there for the day and come home and uh i mean something that people are probably like why would you ever give up all these secrets and everything just so people understand i kept these secrets for a really really long time and then i had triplets and my my dream of going to the elite series was gone when we had triplets not that i was realistically gonna go for it or not but just it was always in the back of my mind like one day i might go but when you have triplets and i had those like literally we were you know as soon as like my wife was pregnant and we had triplets on the way like i was developing this brand and this product line and um and for me like my mind shifted from okay my focus is going to be to win tournaments to i would rather see people get exposed to the style of fishing and like let those secrets run free and just bring joy to people through what I've learned because 
yes, I could win more tournaments, but really like at the end of the day, like I feel like I'll get far more, um, I guess like, I feel, yeah. I know where you're going with this. You know I, mean? like, I feel like it's the same, I would it's the rather same know that I help people just have better days in the water and, and catch their PB than win another tournament. Like I've almost, it's kind of like I've already done that. I don't know if that's the same sense. reason that I started doing the YouTube thing, right? Like you start yeah. doing the YouTube thing because you enjoy it and it provides a means to an end, right? Like you yeah. do the YouTube thing because you're like, okay, it's it's a lot of fun. Then you start doing it because it's like, okay, I can make some money. And then you start doing it because you can actually teach some people. And I remember like there was a turning point where I'm like, okay, I can actually teach some people. And I started giving up some secrets. So like one of the very first videos I made, like actual tip videos was how to take the shine off of a tube and i talked about why it's important to be fishing that finish baits and i got some messages from my buddies and they were like why are you telling people about like doling out the colors on your bait this is something we, we've been doing and we we're keeping a secret and i'm like i don't know i just like teaching people how to catch fish yeah and like i remember sit like sitting on the deck of the boat and i'm like kylie i got a tip for you and she filmed me and I posted it and it was like immediate, but there's something about that switch in your brain. That's like, I just want people to catch fish. And like, I just want to help people learn and go out and have fun. Like, cause I also thought I was going to fish the elites. I thought my path was going to be through the opens and like, I got to keep all these secrets and now it's a very different mindset, but. I feel like, um, I resonate with that. You know, like when I first started doing it, I almost felt like, okay, I'm going to make these baits, but I'm going to keep the best colors to myself. And I was actually just talking with Travis about that with a brand he's worked with. And like the guy who owns it wanted to keep the best color to himself. And as I've like started to release these secrets, I almost like I went from being like, it felt weird to do that to now all I want to do is tell everyone what I've got because as I put more out there and help more people, I, I seem to get that back from the fishing community in the form of thanks and support with the company. And like, I almost, and people start catching the fish that you've been catching right next to them. And they're like, I hate to say this, but it actually starts selling more product, right? Like if you cap, yeah, but you, but you like, I guess what I'm getting at is like, I almost feel like, I don't want to say I'm getting more friends, but like you just feel like people just start to like really, really, truly appreciate it. Like I'm really seeing it in the messages and like people taking time out of their day to be like to thank us. And like that just feels so much better than winning first place and getting a, a trophy, a trophy and cashing a check. And then your buddy and you are just like, hopefully you guys are friends forever, because if you're not, you're not going to be able to ever tell that story with each other again. You know what I mean? Like, I just feel like, the overwhelming appreciation and support from the angling community has just made me want to share more with everyone. Yeah. It's like not hold anything back. Um, and it's just a really good feeling and you just feel like it just, I just feel great about it. I don't know how to, I've never really talked about this actually. Like no one has really asked me or we never, I've never really got into it. So I'm having a hard time finding the words and expressing how I'm feeling, but that, that really is it is like, it's almost freeing in a way yeah that and people are just having a great time just doing what you know is awesome. the other thing to, so this to me is what draws me a lot to the content piece like i love to share the content and i love to give like the tips and sometimes i give nuggets that i probably shouldn't give or like my buddy nathan is a phenomenal fisherman and he figures out these like micro details and this is what i love about fishing right like i love when you figure out okay like there's something about this color that makes fish bite like this time of year and there's a reason that it works and we can figure these things out and like the things that i figure out by myself i feel comfortable and i like love to share and dudes will be like hey this is our a little nugget and there's so mm -hmm. many parts of me that are like i told him one time i'm like i don't want to know the nuggets anymore I'm like, I don't want to be burdened with the the knowledge of these incredible secrets, right? Because yeah. there are times where there's a certain bait color that just seems to make a difference. So in the post-spawn, we get into, uh, well, excuse me, in the pre-spawn, we'll get like all the perch pushed around the grass. And then post-spawn, they'll start to move back out to like the deeper patches of like the Elodea. 
Yeah. And so like you can get on these crazy perch bites in like mid June, basically through the month of July and like 12 to 14 foot of water. And you'll see other guys fishing through there and just not getting bites. But it, to me, the key is like the certain color that I fish. I have a perch color that I fish through there. And I've talked about it on the channel quite a bit, but like the reasons that that makes sense and me sharing that to me is like when someone messages me, they're like, man, I was on St. Clair and that perch color was the deal. Like it was the deal where I was out fishing people next to me. And I'm like, oh man, it feels so good to be able to share and like help these people yeah. catch fish that maybe otherwise they wouldn't or experience something. Maybe they otherwise would. I don't know how to explain that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, for like, I totally understand. I mean, the only, the only line that I draw is giving out information that I feel like it hurt the resource. Like that's important to me. So like really try to be protective of the spots. Um, just trying so that, you know, people don't exploit it and go out there and try to learn it on their own. And, and really at the end of the day, there's not, there's not too many people who, will actually go put in the work. So, um, and I'm also really fortunate, just like your buddy, Nathan there, like my, my turn partner, Matt, I mean, some of the stuff that he, like he's figured out and he's even spent the day going fishing. He calls me, he's like, Hey man, I started doing this and we'll go do it. And then next thing you know, I'm developing a bait through Great Lakes Fest. He doesn't own any of it. He's not even, he's just my tournament partner and he, he runs another business. He runs another company, um, actually in the, in the hunting clothing space called tiny goose. And yeah, if anyone wants, I should give him a shout out here, but yeah, if anyone would need clothing, hunting clothing for their kids, that's what he does. So I'm really fortunate that he, um, is so supportive of me and the brand and, and really not protective because there's not a lot of anglers that would allow me to share what I share. And he's so like, he'll even film and let me film him. And, um, and that really is a lot of, has a lot to do with the success we've had is because of his support. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you got to have that partner too. Like there's so much of this fishing stuff. You can't do any of it alone. Yeah. I mean, I'm always learning. Right. And and people, and what's cool is like part of the brand, like even, you know, I was talking about putting out there these secrets. Well, in return, I didn't mention it earlier, but people are providing me with secrets back and they don't even know me. And they're like, Hey man, I catch them on this. Like if you made this color and then we'll start playing with like, I write all of the stuff down and like take notes and, and then we'll go try stuff. And that's all just because we're putting ourselves out there. And then the angling community is giving back, um, in the form of support, praise, you know, sales, ideas, like all that just, I think that's something that a lot of people miss is like, the more you give, the more you seem to receive. Um, 100%. yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. So what's the next step for GLF? Like you guys just dropped these baits. Like, are you working on, are you already starting to think about new stuff? Are you just like trying to breathe for a half a second before you have to go down to the classic? I, I've got several new baits that have already been tested and we're just trying to get them to a point where they're, um, we can produce them at a high enough volume that um, they're still of high quality. But to answer your question, I've got another, what you're seeing here today, we probably got another, probably this amount that we're going to launch before the classic. And then I've got stuff that I just couldn't squeeze into this year. So it's going to go to next year. Um, I've got like four years of products lined up that we've already started designing. And I mean, I just can't wait to get it all out there because I want to fish it too. And I only have so many prototypes. So I want to get like, that's part of the motivation too, is like this juvie craw. I only had, you know, those production, like those test molds, like you can only make so many baits. And so I was limited to how much we could get like the Helgramite, Like when we got our, our sample set, like we were burning through them so fast because the fish were eating them like crazy. I'm like, we just need this to go to production. So I can, I can use these more regularly. More that's regularly. Like I'm really, I'm really interested in the Helgramite. Um, is just like if you had two, if you had two or three colors, like the brown special and then green pumpkin, is that is that the deal for you? For me, black. if I'm gonna fish it, I'm gonna fish the brown pumpkin special, the black and green pumpkin. Those are probably gonna be the three I start with. Um, but green pumpkin, purple. 
like is there a certain thing you're looking for to throw that over like a drop minnow or is it just like no if they're eating the hunger mite they're they're gonna eat one of those they'll just eat eat it and then one color will outperform the other color on a certain day so i would say like if we throw like say i'm out with matt and we're like hey we're gonna throw the helger mite let's we're on a, we pull up to a rock pile and like, let's try helger mites he's gonna throw the black i'll throw the brown pumpkin and then we'll see what they're on better and uh and then i might switch it up and i'll definitely throw the green pumpkin before i i put it away um if i haven't got a bite on any of those three i'm probably just done with the helger mite for a while that's interesting mm -hmm. um what's supply look like for this Pardon? year uh, what, do you, what does supply look like for you guys this year? A lot better than before. Um, so as like some people might not know, but um, for us, we just, when we started this company, it just, we spent no money on, our, on advertising. It was literally just start an Instagram account, start posting content. And next thing you know, we were getting calls from like Fish USA, like DNR Sports, all the dealers in Canada wanted it. Um, I think we got to a 30 retailers and we just, we kept hiring more people and trying to make the stuff and we just could not keep up. And it got to the point where we had to cut off retailers or like no more retailers because the retailers would get our stuff. They would place a, like a big order. And then the next day after they, they would be sold out of that order and they would double the order the next day. And then they would get that and they'd be placing another order like a few days later. And it just got to the point where we were just so overwhelmed. People were so angry that they couldn't find this stuff anywhere, even though we were sweating because we just could not, like, it didn't matter how much effort we put into it. There was no way we were going to catch this freight train of demand. And, uh, and then Pradco approached us and basically just provided the perfect scenario for the brand where, we were able to scale our production, maintain, if not improve the quality and also tap into some marketing channels, which I mean, for me, the goal has always been to bring this style of fishing to as many anglers as possible and making the products easily accessible. And, and we've achieved that with Pradco. And prior to this business, I ran a company called uh, National Pro Staff and we did so many things right at that company and we did so many things wrong. Um, but one thing I, I did learn from that business was providing really great value to customers is the most important thing, quality and customer service. If you don't have those two things dialed in, anything else is just a waste of time. And then also doing that, I got to meet a lot of great people and the people at Pradco were honestly the most genuine down to earth, fair people that I'd ever met in this industry. And this industry has some real shady people and, uh, so the opportunity to do that with Pradco and those people specifically was a no brainer. And, and what you're seeing is like, we were getting calls from people saying like, Oh, Pradco owns it. There goes the, the brand. As soon as a big company takes it, the, the quality goes away. People were scrambling to try to get it whatever they could before the production shifted. And for me, that was almost like a personal mission of mine to be like, look, not only are we going to be just as good? I like, for me, this product release was about a statement of not only is it going to be the same, it's going to be better. Like the quality is going to be better. The stuff we can do like this, this Juvie Craw, like there's detail on every side. There's, there are very few companies. I would say you could count them on one hand who can pull this off. Like you can't, you can't just go somewhere and get a company to cut a mold and, and pull this, this product off. And, being able to really go to Pratco and then committing com entirely the resources to do the most like this product here, this Juvie Craw was not only the longest to develop, but also the most expensive product that they've ever developed. And that's just the power of this partnership and, and being affiliated with Pratco. So now I'm staying with the brand. I love the company. My, my total, I'm still the, the guy who is as passionate as day one and now I've just got resources to be able to well, do what I want to do. I remember I was actually sitting at this desk when you called me and you're like, Hey, just so you know, I've been working on something over the past couple of months. And like, we, we just started working with Pradco and immediately my thought was like, I think my question was you was, okay, are they still going to be able to do the matte finish? And then yeah. what does that mean for you 
working with Great Lakes Finesse, and you're like, okay, nothing actually changes. Like, no, we're just going to be able to help out more. So all we, did like, was, all we did was we took everything we were doing and just scaled it up with their resources and their factory and their people. And because of the experience they had, the quality of our product just has become so much better. Like, their quality control is so much tighter like stuff that we would usually like we would have put in the package before just gets put aside like it does not make it to shelf so i would say the quality of every drop minnow like there's no there's no little tag ends or, or anything on the baits coming out of the practice side and um i would say the quality is probably 25 to 30 percent better across the board in terms of just overall satisfaction of the product quality yeah it's phenomenal it's really good now. Like if, if you get a, a package of the old stuff and you buy a package of the new stuff, you're just like, yeah, the new stuff is, is a lot better and no change to the material at yeah, all. It's, it's phenomenal. So yeah. I have one last question for you. I know it's going to let you got three kids. Um, but, um, when did you start? So like your inspiration for Great Lakes Finesse was to bring a product to market that you actually believe in and use. When did you start fishing this way? Like, who taught you or how did you learn like this finesse kind of mindset? So this finesse mindset in my, so a guy named Steve Delier. So this guy is someone who, when I joined the Rapala pro staff when I was like 16 years old, I was one of their youngest pro staff. And I remember like in Canada, we had like icons on the team. Like, like I was super intimidated, but Steve took me under his wing and made me feel super at home and we developed a friendship that to this day is super strong like we're really great friends um he's retired now he doesn't really fish tournaments but um i would say like 15 years ago he really figured out that there was a a bit of a play here maybe more like probably closer to 20 years ago with a super light line and spotting fish and throwing really micro baits at them and he was really in my mind the pioneer of this technique and then you got guys on the elite series that everyone knows to do really well on the elite, like in the Northern swing and stuff like, but really a lot of those ideas originated from Steve and then got out. And, um, he taught me his ways with like the long rod light line. And then I just, I've always kind of been a little bit more obsessive than him. Like he kind of gets not to knock him. Like he just, he's an incredible angler. Like his, his ability is more of like six cents. Like he like not six cents, the brand, but like, yeah. he's like almost in tune with fish more so than me where my strength is more technical and being more like driven by the goal and he just kind of goes fishing and whatever like he can throw a bait over the back of his shoulder and catch a big one i can't do that like i for me it's about being technical and dialed in and um so he was the guy who kind of introduced me to this style and then i just took it to a whole nother level and spent well over 10 years dialing this in keeping it a secret winning tournaments guys would be throwing like regular jerk baits and even the hair jig like you know when people came with the hair jig i mean that was we were onto that pretty early when guys were doing that and um i was already like okay if guys are all gonna fish hair jigs what am i gonna do next and that was like the cindy rig right so i'm always trying to stay a step ahead um and the cindy rig to me has completely replaced i don't know where my jig box is um i think it's in my boat but i've got a huge jig box of hair jigs that i tie with the right hook and i make my own heads and i used to like sit there for hours and tie them i haven't thrown one in oh god it's got to be three years now it's like yeah all those jigs i tied like no they're probably rusted together at this point i don't even know they could all be rusted i don't even know i haven't even looked in that box so i have a box of be like 200 of them in there Yep, so, I feel um, yeah, I haven't thrown one in, in three years and I've caught more smallmouth in the last three years than I have in my own entire life. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, any quite like, are there any questions? I didn't see if there's any questions from people. Uh, I've been trying to keep up with a lot of the questions. Um, so where'd motor oil come from? Did someone suggest that? Is that a color that Travis, you guys... Travis, Travis wanted that one. He's got a lot of confidence in it. He told me about it one day um he probably doesn't even remember that he told me about it and i was like yeah we're gonna start trying motor oil i fished it i was like yeah it's incredible it's going in the lineup is Travis it just Jay. going to be in the juvie or is it going to be in other baits too um based on the response i mean it's hard to say if like 
that color in particular, but a lot of people are buying that color. Um, but they're also buying every color. Like I'm not kidding. I've never seen anything like it. Like I've never seen a response. Like I, th I figured people would get it, but the messages I've gotten are almost weird with like how crazy people are willing to get. Like I, like I was talking to a dealer, one of the bigger dealers around here and like I said earlier, like he was literally had to break up a fight in the store because he put them up on the shelf. Half of them sold. Like he only got them up in the afternoon. Half of them sold overnight online. He completely sold out. And then there was a lineup of people at his door when the store opened. So they were rushing to that section to buy whatever was there. And then he opened up the orders and saw that they were already sold out. So he was trying to pull them away and guys had them in hands and like it started to fight. <laughs> And he's like, I have never in my life seen anything like this. And he's been in business longer than pretty much any of the retailers in this area. He's the longest running retailers. I've never seen a, a re, like a, a response to a bait like I have with this bait. It's crazy. So on the Juvie, um, I think all the colors except for motor oil say floating. Is that? Do they yeah. So, so the motor oil um, isn't a floating material. So that one isn't. And the reason okay. is the floatant that we use in the material um, actually creates the more thicker look, like it, the more dense look. So if we're going for like a, for this color, we could not achieve that in the floating material. Okay. So that one doesn't have it and neither does the, the white, like the frosted shad. Oh. So those are two colors that don't have the floating in them, unfortunately. So that's why we called that out. But same thing with the snack crawl, like the green, the um, the smoke purple flake. Um, that one doesn't have floating in it, but it there's just times where they just want to eat that color and that profile, so it's yeah. in the lineup. But yeah, I mean, not all of them. Like, but the more dense colors, like the matte black, like the the like even our green pumpkin. Like, this is a really great example. So, like our green pumpkin. Um, I'll just show you this one. So, this is the green pumpkin on top. This is the orange green, but I'll just give you an example. So. The snack craw has the floating in it, and this one is the neutral buoyancy, and they're both green pumpkin, but they're different because of what we put in them. That's interesting. I yeah. was going to ask, so there was a, another question. Is a hugger my standard plastisol? So that's the one with neutral buoyancy. I'll and never then, I'll never reveal what's in there. Oh, but I mean standard. like, but the hugger mites the neutral buoyancy, and the snack craw is the one with the floating. So yeah. that's why they're a different color. Of, yeah, uh, yeah. Green Gotcha. Yeah, so we, we've got something in there that's pretty sneaky that makes it do what it does. And, um, yeah, cotton that's cool. balls. He's actually grinding up cotton balls to put them in there, guys. <laughs> well, you just rip, like, and that's that's actually Steve, my buddy Steve, gave me that tip a long time ago. We because we'd sent the baits and just like squirt scent up, and he was like, cotton balls, just thread them on the hook, push them way up there, throw the scent in there, and it just hold the scent longer. Oh, that's um, so sweet. Oh yeah, we've done really crazy things. I mean, I used to put stinger hooks on my tubes and like just obsessed about landing as many fish as possible. Like it was nuts. One more time on Tuesday, which is just my my thing. Oh, I have one last question, just for my own personal knowledge. So, because it's sold through Pragco, is it available to all retailers through Pragco, or how does that work from? A retailer perspective like if they wanted to carry glf can they go to the same retailer or bit or um distributor that yeah. they can buy Pragco through so like yeah got, anywhere that they're buying like yum booyah cotton cordell like all those brands um anyone that they're buying from will be set up to supply them with great lakes finesse from a dealer perspective from a retailer perspective um and then so all the dealers pretty much know that at this point and then from a, an angler level, I mean, you can go to lurenet.com. Um, I think you got a code that you, I don't know if you want to share. I know you're affiliated with uh, Yeah, I shared it over in, it's in the description. So if you guys want to save 15%, Omnia does not have this stuff. Um, Lurenet already has the Helgramite, the Juvie, the Hank, and they have all of it. So, so if you guys want so to check it out. Omnia will have it, and that was totally our fault. They put, they were the first one to submit an order. And oh, okay. the order slipped through the cracks. And I actually called them the other day and apologized personally. So they they were on the ball faster than anyone. And they um, that was just totally our fault. They should have had it. So I feel really bad. So 
if you want to wait. I did link them. them. So I did yeah. link them below. So if you want to purchase through Omni, it's also down there, but it just hasn't arrived yet. So they don't have it yet. But if you want to buy it through LureNet like right now, um, there's a code to say 15% off. It's Ben Fish. So yeah. capital B E N F I S H. Yeah. If, if people want to go there and hit that notify me, notify me when it's in stock, they do have product on like that's on the way. So every color yeah. there will be there probably within the week. Yeah. And it's all up on the website. It's already showing as like on the website. So yeah. you can like actually place the notify me. It'll let you know like when it's there. Um, yeah. So I there's that option I think, too. I think they're doing some really cool stuff there. And they're uh, doing so that new premium pro um, the app is really, really, really cool. Um, and there's some cool things that are coming out with that. And then obviously a lot of the product stuff with growing the warehouse I mean, is really exciting because they're going to have a lot more stuff. Yeah. But they have 20% off sale uh, now through, I believe, the 19th or 20th. So either one. I mean, if you want to buy it through LureNet, you can get it right now. Or if you want to wait a couple of days from, you know, you can get 20% off with that code down there as well. Yeah, uh, I will say, so LureNet doesn't ship to Canada. So if anyone's watching from Canada, they'll have to just order from other dealers that already, like if you go to our website, you'll be able to see all the Canadian dealers and pretty much all of them have it now or will have it in the next week or so. All this stuff. Well, that's a great question. That's a great point. So. I get a ton of people from Canada watching. I think Jeff Penner was watching, uh, Joey DiCenzo. He follows all the stuff. So tons of guys from Canada. That's a great point. I, didn't, I, didn't I know both of those guys really well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, well, any other questions for Dan? I, I tried to get to most of them, I think. Um Oh, do you have any plans for tungsten in the future? I really like the smaller profile um, tungsten head, as some, someone was asking. Yeah, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, right now, we're focused on manufacturing stuff in the U.S. and and not overseas in China. And, and pretty much, if I'm not mistaken, all tungsten is made in China just because of how hot you got to get that material. And I think our regulations don't allow for that in North America. So um we've just been so focused on providing really premium baits made in north america and um we're starting to expand a little bit i wouldn't rule it out and we we are looking at other other options but you know for me the quality is really really important um and like i said lesson learned from my previous business I would say like my number one focus before anything else is making sure that the product is is as good as it could possibly be and not just better than like what's out there but as good as i feel we can get it even if it means we got to push ourselves even further and the juvie craw is a really good example of that like we were we probably went through eight to ten versions of that and it was probably okay at the fifth version and i was like we can do better so <laughs> um we're gonna keep pushing here pranko was like okay okay dan like i think oh. i think it's pretty good so I'll give you a really good example of how I was a little concerned when I first started working with them that I was going to drive them crazy. So this mini pro tube head. So it might not seem like much, but where that eye placement is, is so critical for reducing snags and debris when you're dragging. Um, so I'll show you in the tube. So where it comes out in the tube is right at the front. So there's nowhere there for it to like get hung up or build up any like gunk. So when I first, when we first transitioned to their manufacturing, cause we were making these at pretty small scale, they want to go into in bigger scale. So we cut molds and they made one. And this eye was maybe a half a millimeter further back. And I was like, it literally drove me crazy. So I was talking to Matt in the boat and I'm like, Matt, look where the eye is. And we were talking about it. And he's like, man, no one will ever notice. And I'm like, but I know, you know, <laughs> I know. So I literally sent them pictures. And the other thing that was really critical is like how close the lead is to the eye. A lot of tube heads, the eye is too far away from the lead. And then the eye just pokes way out of the tube. And I want the tube head. I want the plastic to almost be 
It like covers part of the it eye. Covers part of the eye. Like you almost just want enough that you can get just your line through, right? Because yeah. so that's how I like it. So like even the first version they sent me were like it was just too far away from the lead and we could have got away from it, like got away, got away with it. But the guys down in Arkansas really didn't understand all this. So like I was sending them pictures of like, move this half a millimeter over and like to such a, like fractions of a millimeter in terms of lead space. And they were just like, apparently like who I was sending it to, like I was sending those instructions in and then the engineers were just like shaking their head. They're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and they were just like, this was like one of my first couple months working there. And they were just like so annoyed by me. And I just, I, I could not, like even Matt was like, no one will notice. It'll be fine. It'll probably still work just as good. But I knew. And it just was in my gut that we had to just not settle. So we don't settle on anything. I just want to say, so like I keep playing with the Juby Craw. Like I have it off screen. I just keep touching the Juby Craw. It's very interesting. The overall plastic like density differences in the physical bait itself. So like you have like a harder head on, on the top section of the bait and then it gets like almost soft on the nose. And then on the bottom, it's like really soft and collapses super easy. Yep. But then you have like, I don't know how to explain it. There's different like plastic densities throughout the bait itself. It's, it's really, if you've ever fished a dipped tube, literally they take a stick and they dip it in the plastic and then they pull it out and they dip it again. And then they pull it off and they cut the tails. So like it's all one density. Like this is not, I don't, I don't know how to explain it. It's just different density of plastic all the way around the tube. Okay. So I'll, I'll explain that. So again, we went through like eight to 10 versions of this. So the first version I got of this didn't look like this but it was also as thin as the bottom so the bottom is thinner right like the claws are thicker the middle is thin but the whole body was the thinness like the it was as thin as the bottom of it yeah. so literally i was so excited i got the first prototype they only sent me like two the first time and i'm like okay two that's gonna i'm gonna hopefully it'll <laughs> snag right yeah I literally got a bite i set the hook and the hook came back with no tube and i'm like that's not going to work. So that was why we ended up like making this section more dense, especially the top where the eye pokes out. And then the yeah. bottom right here where it's going to rub a lot on rocks and stuff, we really beef that up. And then also we beef this section up because that's where the hook is. Right. And, yeah. uh, and even the tentacles, like the first version, like this little guy has a slit right at the top in the head. The first version wasn't supposed to have that it was supposed to just have like the hook coming through the tentacles what we were finding is every cast the tentacles would be on either side of the bait other sorry other side either side of the hook so then we're like okay hey, now we need to integrate like a bit of the beef in the head to support the hook and we also didn't want the hook to move from there so it's almost like having a pre-rigged bait when you actually have our tube head in there so it performs that way, but it's actually a tube and you can just replace the tube, change colors, like change different head sizes, like something that doesn't exist with some of these pre-rig expensive baits from some of these JDM companies. Um, so like, yeah, you're right. Like, and even the flat bottom. So like the first version, like it's, this one's flat. The first version was round and I would put it on the table or we put it in the tank and it would roll over. I'm like, well, that's not going to work. Like we want this, we want to be able to dead stick in it to sit there, right? So we went back and said, okay, we got a flat in the bottom. And now with our mini pro tube head, that this thing naturally sits, like you can sh you can shake it and always wants to return back to sitting up. I don't know if you can see that, but yeah, it like you can shake that. It always wants to stay sitting up. So be, when you pair this head, which is again, like people love this tube head because it makes the tube sit that way. You put that in the, in the Juvi craw. And now you just stick the tenant, like put that right between the tentacles. And now you've got a bait that like is perfectly rigged and, uh, and will sit perfectly flat. So like so much went into this, like even the little ribs on the top of the claws, like we didn't want a flat spot. We wanted, and those, so these are scuff marks, so, like all these little ribs and stuff those are intentional. So we used to fish tubes and the more fish would bite them, they'd get those little tear marks from the sandpaper mouths and they would just get better and better. So that's why 
our baits have all these little scuff marks on them to imitate that so that way as soon as you're fishing the bait it's almost like it's been chewed up by a fish like it just that you know, is so cool yeah so, like that's there's, why so there's marks on the this entire thing yeah yeah that's just that's not see cosmetics it. that's just so it looks like fish have been chewing on it wow that is so cool and it really did obviously you designed it sort of with that tube hook in mind how did you it's like perfect with that tube hook in it because like i tried to rig it on what i would just consider like my normal i pour just it's literally like a ball head and i throw this in a tube just because it's like tiny right so i can put it into my 2.75 it fits differently than a normal glf tube head yeah completely different um well it's designed to pair with it um just because the tube head is naturally flat the bait when we were designing it actually the first version we thought we were going to use the ball head and then we realized that the tube head was a better fit so we ended up going with the the tube head and then molding the bait so we've got an incredible designer that i work really closely with his name's tyler and kudos to him because he makes the stuff seem easy and i know it's not and he's willing to work with me being as anal as i am and uh but we're both so proud of this bait um because of like how much went into it and the detail and and everything was thought through from like the front to the back like you should have seen the first version like oh gosh like compared to this thing it was like not even close like and we just iteration after iteration dialed it in slowly seeing how the fish bite it where the hook position is how it holds up i mean all of those things were just constantly being analyzed um like i had a bait that's going to come out next year that i was testing this summer and it was getting a bit like crazy like you would throw this thing and it's kind of it's going to come but i was losing too many fish with it and i could not figure out what was going on and we were like, well, it's too good not to release. And then I figured out one minor adjustment that looked kind of goofy. But as soon as we made that adjustment, the landing ratio went to like high 90s. And we weren't losing them anymore. And I'm like, hey, now we've got it. So that that is sitting there. It's, it's going to be ready to go for next year. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. So I got a uh, question came in. Is spicy melon color coming to the new baits? Which one is spicy melon? So this is spicy melon. Oh, okay. AKA the cheat code um i don't know why and funny story on this color when we were developing the drop minnow with travis um he was like he just wanted a handful of colors so i had my colors like the black green pumpkin all the standard colors most of them aligned with what he was he wanted but he wanted this color and we were kind of at a point where we had too many colors and i actually wanted to get rid of it I literally like kind of, I didn't fight with him, but I was like, we don't need it. And he's like, no, we need it. And then he fought me on it. So I didn't know about that color. So I go out the first time we get these and um, I was fishing with all of the other colors. Actually we were bed fishing. And um, so we we're bed fishing, we're throwing black, green pumpkin, you know, meltdown, like this chartreuse color. I don't know if you see that, you know, it's like more of a chartreuse to trigger them. Yeah. And then we just, we caught so many fish that day. And then I got to the point where we're like, we were having to still work for each fish. Like it would take like a minute or two to get a fish to bite. So I'm like, well, Travis fought pretty hard for this color. I'm going to try it. I kid you not. As soon as I threw it in at the first fish, it was like instant. And then the next fish instant. And then the next fish. And it was like, it immediately became apparent to us that like, there was something about this color that drove them crazy. So then we started experimenting by fishing the bait and not hitting the bed. And these fish would come like, you could miss the bed by six feet and they would swim over to it and eat it immediately. And then what is, <laughs> what is, I don't know why I, I can't explain it, but this color is honestly a cheat code. And this is the one that we use in tournaments. Travis uses it. And it, and Palmer it started using it at St. Lawrence, and he agreed. He was like, this, "This, I don't understand it, but this color is absolutely insane." I saw a lot of guys dropping this color on St. Lawrence, and I thought it, so. Like Strike King has a color; it's like a melon. Copper. Yeah, I think a lot of 
companies have like a relatively similar color and i'm i've always been like man it looks so dumb so i don't know if it's like a, if you know you know and then you start fishing it and then it a hundred percent like it like it was almost the last color that i ever tried and I, I just try them all right but i'd never tried this color because this wasn't one that i wanted um and that's the only and that's why it's only available in the drop minnow because travis was specific that he wanted this in the drop minnow so i never considered adding it to other baits but it will go we'll probably add it to other baits um other styles of baits but yeah it's that drop minnow in that color it just it, it's unbelievable on the st lawrence anyway like i don't know and lake ontario like it's just incredible iridescent so there's a question about iridescent yeah um, so that's this guy here it's 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 like a clear yeah so that's a really interesting color um what's the question i might be able to answer it or i can tell you about that color and why we use question it. question is like why do you use or when do you find that color to be go-to um calm conditions you want to be really like Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna dig into something else that not really people understand. Um, short answer is I went to Japan. I found this color in a bait that no one makes around here. Brought it home. I lot like I ran out of those baits within half a day because th this color works so well. The other thing that I've learned over the years is that these fish are far more aware of their surroundings than we realize. Like we might be fishing in 40 feet of water and and dropping down on fish like they can find like the smallest little bait better than we think like we think we need obnoxious baits because we need to draw their attention in but like i almost think about smallmouth like say you're sitting in your living room all of a sudden like and you've got like lighter wall or white ceiling and a spider crawls in the corner of the ceiling like it's so small and you're watching tv and all of a sudden you see the spider crawling on your ceiling like you're aware of it and you're so in tune with your surrounding and immediately you know like there's something out of place like uh -oh. they're the same way like they can detect things that we don't understand they can detect and like this is like kind of one of those colors where i'm almost intentionally trying not to be seen because i want them to think that they they can't see it like i want the small mouth to feel like this thing doesn't think i can see it okay so i fish frost not frosted what's the one this clear shag same, color. same same idea so like i fish this one we get on a bite where i'm like oh man they're on i don't know what they're on to be honest but like white bass or like white perch and they get on this color like crazy but that iridescence like a very similar thing they'll get off this bait and like will not touch hardly anything until you drop down to almost a clear bait I've never fished the iridescent, but like I can see it being in those same situations. Like it's just too calm where the bite becomes really, really, really tough where the iridescent, like you said, it's just there. Like it's so, so, so subtle that it's like just there. And oh it's my, almost like you're tricking the fish into thinking that they've tricked you. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how to explain it, but like you want the fish to feel like they figured it out. Like, yeah. Oh, I see you. Okay, I'm coming to get you. Like it almost. Whereas, like, if they're really off and you throw something obnoxious and big, they're like, "Whoa, that doesn't seem weird." Because nothing in nature in my surroundings right now wants me to know that they're there. Like a crawfish isn't yelling, "Like come eat me," you know, or a, a leech. Or like they're trying to hide. Like even a helgramite. Like we intentionally didn't want this thing to float because a helgramite is not trying to float with its butt up to get eaten it wants to be hiding in the rocks and scurrying away and staying low to the bottom so it's blending in with its bottom con like whatever it's hanging out on like we're we're almost trying to make these baits not noticeable if that makes sense like we want them to be sneaky hidden but then these fish are smarter than we think and they easily find the stuff well it's like you start to look for colors that a lot of Japanese companies have these really, really, really finesse colors. So Dual Realis is another one that has like very specifically like dumb style colors or, um, oh, is it Rains maybe? Who makes the bubble and shaker? They yep. have colors that are like super, super iridescent. Yep. And it's like a lot of these North American companies go for the big, bold, like a green pumpkin, a brown back, a, like 
they're so always in your face. And even when they're finesse, they're still a natural. They're still like in your face. There's something about that almost do nothing color that tricks fish to bite in situations where you can't get them to bite or shouldn't be able to get them to bite. Yeah. Like I'm a huge believer in like matching. I mean, I shouldn't say that because now I'm contradicting myself, but like sometimes matching the color of the water. And, and that's kind of why I think the spicy melon might work good because if you, it almost blends in with the water color when the sun hits it on the St. Lawrence, it's got that like aqua. So it almost kind of blends in. Like if you look at the, um, there's probably footage of it like underwater somewhere. And uh, I think in one of our videos that we released, we used the spicy melon and it like, you can kind of, it almost blends into the water a little bit. And I feel like that might be what's triggering those fish is they're thinking like, oh yeah, this thing is trying to be chameleon in the, in the surroundings, but I see you and I'm going to eat you. It just, yeah, it's so good. I wish I could find it. Uh, yeah, probably on our Instagram or something, but I don't know. I mean, I can, it's probably in our uh, story video. We released a story video um, right on our oh, main yeah. channel, the YouTube channel. I think it's in that video. And that's just like a seven minute video that kind of like talks about the origins of the brand and, and what got us onto this stuff and what's going on with the brand. If anyone wants to check that out, it's we put a lot there, of so that. meltdown is meltdown for you then more like a bed fishing style color versus like what other sneaky colors do you have any other sneaky colors or you're just like when you were picking colors you're like me where you have your staples and then the other ones fill in so so the meltdown was uh was for sure initially intended to be a bed fishing color like I thought for sure when we were developing this product line, like meltdown was getting, like, that was always kind of my color, that chartreuse to trigger fish on beds. But now the spicy melon has taken over that. Like I'm always learning, right? Like silver blade, gold blade. Um, but we also found that this, that, that chartreuse works really well when it's super cloudy or windy and you need like a slightly brighter bait when the sun's not pounding on it. It's almost like a duller green. If that does, makes sense. Does it like glow? So like you ever, you fish matte colored jerk baits right like when you put a matte colored jerk bait in off color water it like has like an aura around it right like i've not really fished meltdown but does it kind of have like that glow factor almost i can't say for sure i don't i don't quite know um it definitely is super bright and it, it is it, there's a little bit of glow but i'll be honest like i don't fish the meltdown all that often it's very very specific situations now that i'll use the meltdown but there are there's obviously something i don't know because there's people who buy the crap out of that color so someone's figured something out and that's what's really cool is i i'll see weird behavior where i i know someone has figured out something with one of these baits and i'm like man i wish i knew what they were had figured <laughs> out um but yeah we saw a lot of that one the people that i know smash them that's so cool mm -hmm. matt, matt hopped in here and said that uh, smallies are masters of their environment, caught them on the iridescent or smoke in, in pure mud. I mean, I think that's the best um, description of what you were talking about, right? Like they know when there's something that's just off. Yeah, I didn't know Matt was watching. So hey, Matt. Um, <laughs> Matt, Matt is, uh, Matt's an incredible angler. Like he is, um, I call him the PB smasher because he just proceeds to beat my PB every time we go fishing. He's like incredible. Um, I can't be more thankful for him as a tournament, a, like tournament partner. Like we, we make a really good team and he brings a lot of skill and knowledge to the table. Do you uh, guys have I, different styles or like, like when you think about a tournament partner, right? Like what do you look for or what does Matt have that you think makes you guys work well together? So for me, when I think about Matt, like, He's got the same level of obsessiveness, attention to detail, really smart guy who can like really think about things that other people aren't thinking about. Um, like he, he'll call me randomly and be like, Hey, like think about this. I'm like, geez, like I never thought about that. And um, like, honestly, like we would not be doing anywhere near as good as we do together on the St. Lawrence without him, because he, I will fully admit he knows it better than I do. Like he's just putting way more time into it than me. But what I bring is more locally here on some of the inland lakes. So like 
what he brought in terms of knowledge of the St. Lawrence, I was able to return in like Rice Lake, a lake that I've dominated on for a long time. And, and then, but combining the two, for me, I feel like we've really, like we, since we've fished tournaments, I think we've fished, I don't know, like we've been fishing for a handful of years now, but we've only had one tournament that we didn't place lower than third place together. And that's because we, just bring in my opinion such a level of like attention to detail and obsessiveness about smallmouth yeah we had one event that we placed sixth and that was the only one that we didn't get a third or better um but he's just like he's just so i didn't even know like he's almost like a prior to knowing him i didn't even know that he was as as skilled as he is so um yeah really happy to have him like a lot of the stuff in the lineup is inspired by his ideas as well what do you think makes like i think one of the hardest things about fishing team tournaments is finding like the ultimate partner like finding a guy obviously that gels well with personality wise but like i think about dirds and and i'm getting back into tournaments this year not big level but local state level stuff just for it's a different drive than just fun fishing um but like i look at nathan and i and i look at what he brings to the table as a tournament partner like he is so attentive to detail and I am more of just like, I'm going to grind until I figure it out. Like just put in the time and like spend mm -hmm. the time on the water. You have to have like these differences in style a little bit, but also that same obsession and drive and motivation. Like Dirds called me today. He's done at Gunnersville and he's like, dude, such and such is happening. Like this detail is the key. And when he says it's the key, it is like, whatever pattern he's on like that is the bite but yeah. at the same point we fish similarly we complement each other's styles well enough um it's just really interesting when people start to talk about what makes a good tournament partner i think for me it's it's literally one thing and that's trust like you have to fully trust your tournament partner as soon as you lose that and what i mean by that is like i know that if matt goes to an area and he tells me that there's fish there there's fish there or vice versa like i don't have to go and check behind him like i know that whatever he says is fact and it like i just know he's skilled enough to go pre-fish and we can separate and and do different things and i i believe that he feels the same way about me so i think like where that comes into play is when we're we're fishing a tournament and i just know that we need to go do something like he doesn't hesitate to believe me he's just like yeah we're going and when we get there he's fishing with full confidence and it's no different with when he's got a gut feeling like i'm all in i'm like if you think that that's going down like we're going and we're both so committed and and like it like we're just we're almost the same person and we just have that full trust and you, you if you don't if you have a tournament partner like like people go through different tournament partners. Like I've had other tournament partners. Like I don't think I've ever had that level of trust where like with Matt, he says it's going down. Like it's going down. If he says we're going to go catch five fish there, we're probably going to go catch five fish. Other partners I fish with, they might be like, I, I, there's fish in this area. We'll go there and like, it's wishy-washy and, and maybe it wasn't done properly. And like, you just break down that, like you break down the trust level. And then you start arguing and you don't see eye to eye and like you start building up formulating a game plan for a tournament and it just it crumb it almost falls apart because of the trust you just don't have it and as soon as it's gone it's gone that's it that's, i agree i remember so i fished a tournament with nathan two years ago now two falls ago and there's such a level of trust so like on day one we made a pretty big run to an area and I'm like, dude, I don't know if we're going to catch 20 pounds or, or 27 pounds. Like if we caught 27, we'd be in a really good place. 20 pounds in the fall tournament on great lakes. It's like, you might as well have stayed at the ramp, but like we ran out there. I was on 20, like it was 20 pounds. And I told him it's either 20 or 27. So we hit 20 and I'm like, dude, they're not getting any bigger. He goes, I know one spot, like let's go there. But if we left, it was pretty much committing the rest of the day to it. So, we ran, we stopped there, upgraded like immediately. Like I just knew when he told me, if we go there, we're going to upgrade. So we went there and exactly what happened. And then it's funny because on day two, we ran to a totally different area. I'm like, dude, the wind is right. We just got to go. There's fish there. He trusted me. We went and like 
the wind died midday. We had a really good bag going and we start running back and we have a pretty long run where if you stop, you might have a couple minutes. I'm, I'm running down and I look at the bank and I go, I got to stop for five. And we need five minutes here. If we have five minutes, we're going to catch a five pounder and then we'll have time to get back. So I turn the boat real hard. We set it down. And within like two minutes or three minutes, he catches a five pounder. He puts it on the boat, calls, and we run all the way back. But like yeah. you have to have that level of just like he fished and I and I fished with this true confidence that if one of us says something, like it's it's word. It's like your yeah. own thought. So that's yeah. a really cool insight. I think I think that's what separates like the best teams. Like everyone, once you get to the high level, like everyone can pretty much catch a fish but like in team scenarios like the guys who are consistently on the top it's just because they can work so well together um that's the difference a lot of the time <clears throat> yeah well, man i really appreciate it i appreciate you hopping on um i know it's getting late so anything you want to finish it up with any exciting things you want to mention or, or things to talk about yeah, if anyone's going to be at the Bassmaster Classic, we're going to have a big booth there um, showing all this stuff. We'll have, like, Matt will be there. Um, Frank Scalish, who we work with through Pragco, he'll be there. We'll be jumping on BTL here in a couple days. I'll be on with Frank and uh, Matt. And, uh, I mean, get some Juvie Cross, get them early. They're going to sell out. I don't think we're happy. Like, I'll be shocked if we can keep up with the demand that we're seeing already, even though we've got Pradco level manufacturing. It's just, it's just absolutely crazy. Um, I don't know. I, like just, if you're, if you haven't tried finesse, like give it a shot. It's fun. You, you catch a lot of fish, no matter what, when you're throwing little baits, you're getting bites. Like you might not catch a seven pounder, but you're going to have a fun day. Usually. Um, it's a gateway sure, drug, though, that leads you to like those big fish. I truly believe like when you start fishing finesse, you're just catching fish and like you just start catching numbers and you're like, okay, this is cool. And there's a point where it goes from, okay, now I'm just catching fish to like, holy smokes, I'm catching fish, but I'm also catching like the biggest fish that live in that spot. I have a saying like big baits catch big fish, but small micro baits catch way more big fish. Like there's this yes. whole fad on like giant swim baits and everything. And like, if I have to pick one, I'm going micro finesse all day long. It's just way more consistent. You're seeing that with Palmer, right? Like how many guys are dominating tournaments every day, throwing a giant bait compared to the guys who are dominating, throwing super finesse. And you're really seeing it now, especially forward facing sonar. It'd be interesting to watch as all this unfolds and the dust settles from what I think is probably the most crazy time I've seen in competitive tournament fishing. <laughs> um i mean that's a whole different episode but uh it's pretty interesting to watch right now yeah yeah well cool man i really appreciate it um thank you to everyone that hopped on we had a ton of people checking out the live stream but if you're not and you're just watching it afterwards um there are a couple links down in the description if you guys want to buy any of this stuff check it all out so one links you to lure net which um, you can save 15% with Ben Fish, and one will link you to Omnia. And they're currently running a code for 20% off their entire website uh, using code 20 Spring. So either one of those um, are going to have you loaded up with some Great Lakes finesse stuff, as well as just a bunch of other products from, you know, Pragco products to every other distributor or every other product from Omnia. So thank you all very much for watching. Um, appreciate it, guys. And we'll catch you guys next time. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you all.